Now, how would you like the government to pay for your cigarettes? I'm sure I can hear a few of those answers, but that's what's being debated at the moment in England. The catch is, if it is a catch, is that the cigarettes would need to be the electronic kind. A review has concluded that e-cigarettes, as they're called, are 95% less harmful than tobacco, so prescribing them to people who are trying to give up smoking entirely could save lives. Now, strangely, that could see the government buying e-cigarettes from companies that also produce the real ones that people are addicted to. Adam Brimelow has more. This NHS stop smoking clinic in Middlesbrough is unusual. It actively encourages people to consider e-cigarettes. Health experts have been deeply divided on whether they should be seen as a much safer alternative to smoking or a pathway to a deadly addiction. Elaine Butler, a heavy smoker for 40 years, was nervous about trying e-cigarettes to kick the habit, but so far it's worked. At first I thought, well, it's going to be no good to me. It's too big, it's too bulky, but it, it, it worked, it helped. Along with the other products, it did help me. This independent review was set up to assess the evidence so far on e-cigarettes. The findings are unequivocal. The experts say rather than encouraging more people to smoke, e-cigarettes are helping them quit and are a potential game changer for public health. On safety, they say e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than smoking. But they're worried that nearly half the population don't realise the risks are lower. So at the moment, 80,000 people die every year as a result of cigarette smoking. If everybody who was smoking switched to e-cigarettes, that would reduce to about 4,000 deaths a year. That's the best estimate at the moment. It may well be much, much lower than that. Many health campaigners have welcomed the review's findings, but it hasn't settled the arguments. The Welsh government is planning restrictions on the use of e-cigarettes because of concerns they could encourage more people to take up smoking. Adam Brimelow, BBC News. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now from Edinburgh by Professor Linda Bald, who's Deputy Director of the UK Centre for Tobacco and Alcohol Studies. And with me in the studio is Hazel Cheeseman, who's the Policy Director at the anti-smoking group ASH. Now, Hazel, as you're here in the studio, we've got a couple of the, uh, I was going to say offending articles, less than offending articles, two e-cigarettes here. That's, they, they talk about this as vaping, if you have one of those, and that, I guess you smoke that. Essentially, these are e-cigarettes in terms of a study or report, are they? Yeah, I mean, you, you vape both of them. They both produce vapour, they both heat a liquid and produce a vapour. They might be quite different in terms of their experience and the quality of how they deliver nicotine, but fundamentally they are similar, I suppose, compared to tobacco. OK, so both good news items in that regard. Linda, let me turn to you now on that basis then. What do you think about the scope of this report and its findings? You must be pretty encouraged. This is actually the most comprehensive report that's been published anywhere in the world so far. So it brings together all the current evidence. And I think we can be really confident that it comes to some realistic conclusions, not just for the UK, actually, but for countries across the world about how they should deal with this, what's been called a disruptive technology of the electronic cigarette. Uh, were you astounded by the, the findings or did you expect it? 95% less damaging than, than smoking? Well, I think the devices have evolved. I think the key comparison is with smoking. There are, of course, concerns about children who've never smoked ever using an e-cigarette. But when you compare it with the cigarette, which is a uniquely deadly product, it's not surprising that this technology that isn't combustible, it doesn't produce smoke, um, it's got nicotine in it, but it doesn't have many of the harmful chemicals, is a far better alternative for smokers. Hazel, I have to say, it seems odd, doesn't it, the idea of medication being prescribed but it's medication that nonetheless is still a tiny bit bad for you and there is this concern about uh, uh, as uh, was mentioned there by Linda about youngsters picking up the habit so I mean, it's really not different from giving people other stop smoking uh, medications. So we already prescribe nicotine replacement therapy and gum and lozenges. If um, there was a product, an electronic cigarette product, that was licensed as a medicine, then why wouldn't we prescribe it in the same way as we do those other products? And you keep the others, the patches and all the different, I mean, anything that works? Sort Absolutely, of thing? another tool in the arsenal. I mean, people will find lots of different ways out of their addiction uh, to tobacco. And for some people, it might be electronic cigarettes. For other people, it will be other forms and medication. Of course, they'll also need willpower as well. None of these products are magic bullets, but it's another tool that we have to help people on their journey away from smoking. Um, and what about, um, Linda, what about issues of 
publicizing, advertising, marketing, if this is so much better for you than putting a fag in your mouth, uh, shouldn't that be something that can be put back up on advertising hoardings, for example? Well, we know that around one third of people who try to stop smoking in the UK actually now do it with an e-cigarette. We've never seen that kind of popularity of any other stop smoking aid. And I'm sure actually the marketing has something to do with that. So I think we need some marketing, particularly at the point of sale. But I am concerned about some of the, the really um, creative marketing that might appeal to children. So I think governments across the UK now are looking at the right balance of regulation and promotion of these products. Right. Let, let me pick, pick up on that point as well, Hazel, because I'm told that the I'm not a smoker, never have been, I'm lucky. Uh, but you can have one of these, you can have custard flavour, you can have sweet flavours. I mean, that sounds a little bit close to Alcopop sort of thinking. It a could appeal to youngsters well, directly. So the flavours are really interesting and, um, and there's a hypothesis that the flavours will be appealing to young people. And I think some of the research suggests that some of the flavours might be more appealing to young people than others. But we've also got to remember that the flavours are playing part of the, of, the, of the story about why these products are appealing to smokers as well because actually adult smokers quite like custard flavor and quite like sweet flavors so you know that we can't um, th there's an appeal to these products and there's a risk that they might appeal to young people um, but the appeal is part of the good thing as well because they're appealing to smokers and offering an alternative Linda we've just got time for me to ask you one other point which is there's such a huge disparity in the way different countries regulate for e-cigarettes do you think this report will be picked up as something that enables more countries to look at it in a more uniform way. Well, we know about half of the world's population live in a country where you can buy an e-cigarette, but they're banned in some countries. I would really encourage all governments to look very carefully at this report. In those developing countries that haven't introduced some of the tobacco regulations, like bans on advertising or tobacco taxation, and they, they need to do that. But they also need to consider the place of e-cigarettes, particularly in, in helping people who currently smoke to stop. OK, uh, Linda Ball, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, and Hazel Cheeseman as well, many thanks.